Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on using the Energy Zones online mapping tool, EZMT, to plan for clean energy. This webinar is part of the Clean Energy and Energy Management webinar series. Uh, the series is a collaboration between the Department of Energy, or the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, which is EGLE, um, and the University of Michigan. And the aim of the series is to provide local governments across the state with practical advice for taking actions related to clean energy. I'm Sarah Mills. I am a researcher at the University of Michigan's Graham Sustainability Institute, where I manage this collaboration with EGLE. Um, for today's webinar, we'll take any questions via the questions feature on the GoToWebinar console. Um, as you can see on the screen, it's toward the bottom of that console and um, should be on the right side of your screen. We encourage you to submit your questions as they occur to you throughout the webinar by entering them into the questions field on the webinar console. When you submit a question, it's only visible to organizers. So don't panic if you don't see questions, um, but also if you feel shy asking questions, don't worry. Um, no one else is going to see it. So please do send it my way. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to give you a little background on how this fits with some of the other resources that we've developed for EGLE. So on the Communities tab of EGLE's website, and you can see the link there on the screen, um, this is the same website where you registered for the webinar. You'll see that we've developed a number of resources to help communities in planning and zoning for renewables. Um, there's a curated repository that includes some templates, sample zoning ordinance language, sample um, master plan language, mostly um, uh, for utility scale renewables, specifically wind and solar. Um, but they're particularly in, in both of those um, in both of those kind of sections of the website. There's also language that's appropriate for smaller scale renewables. Uh, the EGLE website also includes a zoning database that links to all of the zoning ordinances in Michigan that we've been able to find. If your community isn't on that, let me know. My email address is right on that website. Um, and within that database, you can see which of those zoning ordinances include energy content um, so that you can see what peer communities are doing. There's also case studies and frequently asked questions um, that uh, about kind of how these projects have played out in communities across Michigan. As part of this uh, partnership with EGLE, I've also given presentations to local governments about planning and zoning for clean energy. Um, and we'll have more presentations on kind of the nuts and bolts of planning and zoning um, as part of this webinar series in the future. But often one of the questions that I get in those presentations is whether and where within a community it might be possible to cite renewable energy. And that's where today's webinar and EZMT comes in. I stumbled upon EZMT kind of by accident, but I have honestly found it to be the best one-stop shop for understanding what existing energy infrastructure communities have and what sort of potential there might be for future clean energy infrastructure. Not just from an energy perspective, though. What I really like about this tool is that it overlays some of the land use characteristics that planners often consider and that ener renewable energy developers take into account when scoping out good sites for projects. So that you can, you as local officials can better understand what parts of your community may be viable for future energy development to kind of ground your conversations about how um, energy might fit in your long-term uh, land use plans. The format for today's webinar is a little different than what we've done for past webinars. Um, there's only one speaker besides myself, and that's Jim Kuiper from Argonne National Lab. He'll start out by giving you some slides on the origins of the EZMT tool, but we'll spend most of the time today actually demonstrating how it works um, through a live demo. Um, as you'll see during that demo, I'm gonna chime in and ask Jim to show me, or really to show all of us, some of the features of the tool that I think are really most helpful um, to land use planners. But again, if you have any questions, um, do use the question function and I'll ask your questions in there too. Um, by way of introduction, Jim is a principal geospatial engineer at Argonne National Lab 
And that is uh, the Department of Energy lab that's based near Chicago. I'll let Jim fill you in on other important details of his background, but I wanted to note that he has Michigan roots, um, having grown up in the state, but also having gotten both his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Michigan. So Jim, without further ado, I am going to turn the floor over to you. All right, thank you. And uh, to our participants, I welcome, and I hope you um, feel free to ask questions and um, direct, uh, direct uh, the demonstration and the discussion toward your interests as much as possible. Um, today, I'll be talking about the Energy Zones Mapping Tool. And um, I'll start out with some slides. Uh, it's got a kind of a lengthy name, uh, but uh, the original intent of the tool um, was to, to stand up a publicly accept available uh, web-based mapping tool. And it's funded by the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Electricity. And it was originally developed for the Eastern Interconnection States Planning Council, um, also mouthful. Um, the acronym we usually pronounce is ICEPIC. Uh, three national labs collaborate, collaborated on the development. Um, so our lab, Argonne National Laboratory, then Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. Um, we also had a lot of collaboration after the tool was launched uh, with Sandia National Laboratories uh, in New Mexico on energy and water uh, activities. There are many uh, ties between energy and water um, and uh, the content and uh, capabilities of the tool were enhanced in that area through that collaboration. This tool was launched in 2012. And um, so um, we're actually funded right now to, to update the interface because uh, the technology is getting a little dated. Um, but uh, yeah, the tool's been running uh, for about eight years now. And we've made many enhancements and updates uh, since its original launch. Um, right there is the homepage and the URL for accessing the tool below it which I'll also have at the end of the presentation. So uh, the scope is pretty ambitious uh, for this project. And um, just a, a quick uh, background, uh, our division at Argonne um, traditionally has done a lot of environmental impact statements. And uh, my background in geospatial uh, technology has really helped in that um, because uh, there's typically a myriad of issues that are needing to be analyzed in an environmental impact statement. And then a lot of geospatial data support those analyses that, that are done. So um, that uh, led to large repositories of GIS data being collected by our division. And uh, that naturally uh, moved into um, sharing data on the web as we wanted to uh, interact with stakeholders. And uh, this tool is kind of one of the results of, of that uh, history. Uh, the tool itself has a lot of geospatial data. Um, it has models, which is pretty novel to host a model with the interface that users can um, run. And it per performs a GIS analysis um, based on your choices. And it has a series of reports that um, you can designate an area of interest and it'll, and it'll create uh, content from the geospatial database and summarize that in a report for you. Um, these categories on the right are the scope. Um, it really covers most of the, um, you know, the grid scale energy generation technologies. So for example, under wind, uh, there are models for land-based wind or um, offshore wind and different hub heights. Um, so beyond the, the nine categories of energy resources are a variety of technologies um, that use that resource to convert it to electrical power. Um, the geospatial library has about 330 layers right now. And um, the content is focused on energy infrastructure energy resources, 
Um, and a lot of it is uh, involves citing factors that are relevant to energy analysis. Um, you know, if you're trying to cite a project or plan for a region and the, the energy production and transport within it, um, there are a lot of things on the ground that affect that, whether it's terrain or um, land use uh, designations or sensitive habitat. So we've got a pretty broad catalog of data along those lines. And then just reference and background layers like boundaries and things like that. Um, there's a capability in, in GIS that's called suitability model modeling, or um, there's a few other names for it. But it basically involves overlaying a set of different um, criteria, um, assigning it some a score, and then computing uh, some sort of um, statistic from it. And um, so that modeling is what the tool has built into it. Um, there's 37 power plant models, and then it also has a least cost path or maximum suitability path uh, concept to generate routes between two points that could be, um, you know, the site of a future uh, transmission line or pipeline. So they're intended to help screen for uh, best paths for, for those sorts of project ideas. Um, it also has tools that allow you to create, import, and download analysis areas, is what we call them. Um, they're just regions of interest that you can designate on the map or corridors that you can designate. And then I mentioned the dynamically generated reports. Um, uh, the panel on the right was uh, showing just a variety of the content that's within the tool, but I think uh, in the demonstration, we'll be looking at a lot of that, so I won't spend a lot of time describing those. Um, our current activities involve continued hosting of the tool, um, so we maintain and update the database. Um, with 330 layers, we have to prioritize that work, so we concentrate on the layers that uh, change most frequently and are most um, most focused on the core capabilities of the tool, and then others that have been added um, that are more uh, used more rarely or or not as dynamic. Um, those aren't uh, changing as often. Um, we're pretty responsive to inquiries. If you have any questions, you can contact us and we can assist you in something related to the tool. Um, it's mentioned uh, the user interface is being redesigned and, and rebuilt um, from the ground up. It's based on open source technology, um, so uh, those tools uh, change over time and there are new tools developed, so we're trying to take advantage of those. And then along with what we're doing today, um, uh, an effort to train uh, folks to use the tool, Modeling and analysis involves just a region in the east, um, not the whole U.S., but um, we're going to be taking advantage of the, the capabilities of the tool for that project. All right, the, the rest of the time will be uh, focused on a live demonstration, and I'll try to allow time for questions and discussion at the end. Um, so I'll just have this final slide um, that we'll, we can show again later. Um, there's a URL for the tool and then my contact information along with the general email address for the, the tool itself. 